Thank you. Thanks. Uh, it's great to be here. It's an honor to be speaking to this group, uh, the, uh, the language science department here at UC Irvine, um, as, as well as the uh, folks there in South Carolina and online as well. Welcome. Um, next week, we will have uh, another great speaker, Linda Worrell. So without further ado, um, let's start talking about squeezing information from picture naming errors, a cognitive psychometric approach. And so here's a outline of the talk where, we're, where we'll be going. So first, what do I mean by squeezing information from data? Talk a little bit about background and goals of measurement and how we're gonna go about this. And how can we encode information from a picture naming task? We'll talk about response type frequencies, network properties, and cognitive psychometrics. And what can we do with this information? Well, we can predict new picture naming responses, hopefully at a, at a minimum, this is a cross validation. And we can look at relationships with other neuropsychological test scores. We can look at relationships with lexical properties of items. And we can look at relationships with structural and functional neuroimaging. And finally, we can look at effects of different types of speech therapy. And I'll try and cram this all in here if we have time. And I'll conclude basically by telling you that the cognitive psychometric model is a measurement tool that extracts useful quantitative information from aphasic picture naming responses. Okay, so what do I mean by squeezing information from data? I like metaphors. So consider today's temperature. What information is in a temperature? Today in Irvine, California, it's 64 degrees Fahrenheit and 18 degrees Celsius. And we sort of have the intuitive sense that 18 degrees Celsius and 64 degrees Fahrenheit is the same information. Um, even though I actually, if you told me 18 degrees Celsius, I wouldn't know if that's hot or cold, but I kind of know that it's the same information as the information that's in Fahrenheit. So what, what's going on there? So the way we think about this is, you know, we think about what other temperature measurements are possible. And we can go on it on online and look at a database and find that temperatures in Irvine December 5th typically range from 50 to 67 degrees, rarely below 43 and rarely above 76. And so here's a distribution and, um, that shows reasonable expectations for what we might find if we just looked at the temperature in Irvine on December 5th. We could also look at popular cities around the world. If I went somewhere else in the world right now and took the temperature, where what other temperatures might I find on Earth? And those range from about negative three to 92. That's where people live. Um, and you, you can see California is sort of right in the middle there. It's fairly mild. Um, but that's only one way that we can think about information. Another way we can think about this is what other data do temperature measurements relate to? Um, so you might have a theory that extreme temperature makes people uncomfortable and uncomfortable people are cranky. And so you might be able to predict from the temperature my perceived comfort level, which you might find because it's a little bit chilly outside. It's a little bit below optimal. You might be able to predict my perceived arousal, and you might be able to predict how much I'm willing to blast an opponent in the ear uh, with white noise if I believe that they have been unfairly provoking me uh, on a previous trial. And, and you can see, you know, the more the more comfortable I am with the temperature, the less likely I am to crank up that volume. And this is not to necessarily uh, endorse these methods or findings. It's just to, as an example to think about, you know, what, what information is in a number when we get a measurement. So to summarize what other measurements are possible, this is fairly constrained by measurement scales and procedures. Uh, we look at normative data to understand this and there are formal statistical methods for quantifying this kind of information when you get a new measurement. Um, and then we also want to think about what other data do measurements inform us about. And this is fairly unconstrained, uh, except by theoretical logic, and it requires the creative empirical research to, to quantify these relationships. So how can we encode information from a picture naming task? Um, Don Bamber, who's um, faculty here at UCI, um, and writes and thinks a lot about philosophy of statistics and reviews statistics textbooks, recently wrote this book chapters, Statisticians Should Not Tell Scientists What to Think. And in this, he describes an approach, a philosophy called mimetic modeling. And the idea here is that a formal model can be thought of as an engineering proposal for a device that mimics nature. 
and good models adequately mimic whatever statistics a scientist might be interested in. So if a scientist can have different goals, they use different models and whatever works uh, is good. And so there's this statistical school of thought, practical Bayesianism, um, which does not really care whether probability is interpreted as a personal belief or inherent variability, right? The goal is just estimation and prediction with uncertainty. That's the goal. Um, the bottom line, do the properties of the model mimic the relevant properties of a natural system under investigation? Do the model's parameters encode useful information? And again, the goal here, the game is to make useful, truthy as possible assumptions, not true assumptions, right? And this is a philosophical issue, but, but it helps sort of frame the game that we're trying to play here. We're trying to make, some, we're trying to say things that are as truthy as possible. We know they're gonna be wrong, but we wanna make the base, best statements we can. So again, just to sort of highlight this procedure and kind of give an outline of it, we get data, this is just raw numbers for measurement, and then we make our model assumptions where we try and make truthy statements about where the data came from, what other data might we have seen, and where would that have come from. Once we have these assumptions, we can do some model fitting where we ask what are the most likely model settings given the data at hand. And then we can ask once we have these settings, which of these should mimic natural statistics? Uh, what, you know, which of these encode information about the world? And we make predictions and look at the associations with, with brand new data um, that wasn't used to fit the model. And so in this way, we're, we're sort of checking our, our assumptions and it's a, it's a cycle. Okay, so two naming responses in particular. Um, what we do is we bring folks in who have aphasia this is a, a language disturbance caused by, um, in this case, a stroke, but any neurological injury. And we ask them to name pictures. And word finding is one of the most common problems. Uh, perhaps all people with aphasia have this problem. So we ask them to name pictures and we uh, have trained people categorize the responses. They transcribe and categorize the responses. And so very often, some they might just have no idea what they're looking at, or they might you know, say something correct. Um, could be a semantic error, just uh, purely related by meaning, could be just purely related by sound. We call that a formal error. The form of the word is, is there, but not the meaning. Could be both, uh, mixed error. Uh, could be unrelated, totally unrelated, but it's still a real word. And it could be a non-word that sounds like the target. And finally, it could be a non-word that does not sound like the target. And so here's a little chart. And um, during, in the last talk, uh, Dr. Fagadiatis, um, mentioned that there are programs that people are working on to score this to make it a little bit more um, replicable uh, people do have good agreement so but this is still something that we have humans doing um, and it's something we're actively working on is sort of uh, formalizing the coding a little of these errors a little bit more but in any case this is this is the the scheme and the data that we're collecting so where does this data come from so this is a very popular network simulation model. Um, Gary Dell and colleagues came up with this. Um, and the idea is it explains sort of where uh, the processes that are involved in naming a picture. Um, so act uh, a simulated naming attempt starts with a boost of activation to the semantic nodes. And these nodes are shaded to represent the activation with light colors representing lots of activation so this is a healthy system activation spreads forward and backward through the network with noise and decay over time and the s weight and p weight um, is the this is the strength of the connections between these levels of representation semantic lexical and phonological and these control the the signal to noise ratio of the flow of activation so in step one, the most active lexical node is selected and this receives a boost of activation and then this activation spreads again through the network. And in step two, the most active phonological node in each syllable position is selected for spell out. Um, so typically the way that we go about fitting this model to data is we adjust these S weight and P weights to, to adjust how, where information is getting sort of squashed in, in the process. Where, where is it getting lost in the naming process? So the S weight and P weight typically range from zero to 0 0.04. Um, it's not a, a linear scale, um, but the numbers vary between zero and 0 0.04. 
these numbers over here are other fixed assumptions that sometimes people do vary to try to fit data. For instance, the decay rate was recently used to explain um, different naming deadline accuracies. But generally, these are sort of fixed assumptions that are lurking in the background that could be right, could be wrong, they could be changed. In any case, remember, we're trying to make truthy statements. And so these, these are part of the statements that we're making that we're assuming are, are truthy. So if there's an uh, S-weight lesion where we reduce the connections, then lexical errors are possible and likely to occur. For instance, just because you don't have very good differentiation of activation here, just due to noise, you might get a, a boost of activation to dog, and then the strong connections will spell out the correct phonemes. Likewise, if you have a P-weight lesion, the activation is not flowing correctly to the phonemes, and so you might come up with a non-word, because you're basically picking phonemes randomly. And so this explains these different uh, settings of S-weight and P-weight can explain patterns of errors. But they're simulation model drawbacks. So these offer plausible explanations, but there can be many plausible simulation models to explain the same data. And perhaps some combination of these different features is best. And we don't really check every possible simulation model that's out there. There, there, there may be infinite models that can explain the same thing. But so here's just some, a few of my favorite variations um, on this, where you can see in all of these, you have activation flowing through a network and you have the same levels of selection. Um, uh, this is the Weaver++ plus plus model, which involves some extra rules for selection and, and moving on to the next level. This is the restricted interaction model, um, where you only have feed forward activation at the top, but feedback at, at, from phonemes. Um, Chen and Merman uh, have this uh, model where they added lateral inhibition to the, to the lexical level, and that accounts for some, some effects that can be observed. And this is a model that Greg and I put out where we duplicated the phonological uh, level for, to represent auditory and motor representations at the phoneme level. And that also explains some interesting things. But the point is, these all explain the same data in, in theory, and, and then also other extra interesting features. So it's not entirely clear which one is, is right. Um, and they might, m multiple ones might be right. Uh, and item effects, so a second problem is that item effects on network structure and function are difficult to estimate at the same time as you're estimating participant network properties, right? Typically, we ask how pe networks vary across participants, but presumably the items that are being named will also impact the structure and function of the network. And that is why these networks are pretty much always modeling just one word, cat. There are some exceptions, but typically that's what, what is going on when we're estimating, when we're measuring people's abilities. But we have lots of other items beyond cat, right? There's lots of other items that have different properties that are gonna drive the system in a different way. Okay, so in comes psycho cognitive psychometrics to the rescue. So Bill Batchelder, uh, who's a professor here for many years, um, and I was lucky enough to take his class and he introduced me to this form of modeling. Um, he sort of proposed, uh, he, he actually didn't propose this. He, he, this originally came for, from genetics where these tree models are popular because you have multiple possible genetic conditions and environmental conditions that under the same um, situation or different situations might lead to the same outcome. Right? It could be a genetic problem, could be an environmental problem. And the idea is to look at patterns in the population to sort these things out. So, what is, so he applied these to psychology. And so the idea here is the cognitive part of this is that overt behavior is a product of latent mental decisions that are independently prone to success or failure. So there's multiple pieces of your mind that have to work together to produce any given behavior that we observe. And these pieces can, can be dissociated. Um, and these don't have to be conscious decisions, right? These, these pieces of your mind don't have to be conscious decisions that are working. It's just that different trains of thought can arrive at the same behaviors under certain conditions. For example, knowing versus guessing the correct answer on a test, right? It's the same observation, same measurement, very different mental processes that happen. Okay, so like I mentioned, the models use the laws of probability and repeated observations to tease apart the likelihood of different mental processing decisions successes or failures given patterns of multivariate data. So the second part, the psychometric part, 
um, at least the way I interpret this, is that this is referring to the fact that the probability of success or failure um, is independently influenced by the demands of the task and the person doing the task. So for any given probability, uh, any, any given piece of your mind that has to, to work, um, there, that, those, those pieces will work better or worse depending on the person's mind we're talking about and also the task that the person is trying to accomplish. Okay, so the multinomial tree model um, that uh, Greg and I and Julius uh, came up with and published in 2018 for picture naming is illustrated here. And, and it shows what the latent decisions are that we have to make to arrive at each of the different naming response types. So there's correct down here at the end of the, these are, the responses are represented as these square leaf nodes at the, at the end. So correct response is there, mixed response is here, formal responses are here, semantic errors, unrelated errors, neologism errors, abstruse neologism errors, no attempt. Okay, so these errors, this shows the, the paths that you have to take to get to these errors. And each branch in this tree is associated with a probability. And the likelihood of each response type, the probability of each response type on a given naming attempt can be calculated by multiplying the branches leading from the root node to the leaf nodes of interest. So uh, to get the probability of a correct response on a given trial, right, we multiply A times B times C times D times E times F. And that's shown here, A, B, C, D, F. And the, these are the equations to get the probability of any of these other response types from this tree, if we know what the probabilities of these individual branches are. So what are these probabilities of these individual branches? So the first one is the probability of initiating an attempt. And I, and you can see I'm, I have created the sort of correspondence between the Dell, uh, Feugel and Dell uh, network model and this tree model. So here I've illustrated that the probability of an of attempt is just do you or do you not get a boost to your semantic units? Um, that's sort of how the model, the network model describes an attempt. You either do or you don't get an, uh, a boost to your semantic units. And if you don't make an attempt, then you don't make an attempt. That's what it's scored as. If you do make an attempt, we go on to the next probability in the processing. So this is the probability of rejecting a totally unrelated competitor. And if you are successful, then we also need have the probability of rejecting a lexically semantic, a semantically related competitor. There's a real word with a, with a meaning relation. Uh, we also need the, to reject the uh, lexical phonological competitors. So these are real words that only share a phonological component with the target. And finally, we need to reject competitors that have both semantic and phonological relationships. These are very close competitors to the target. And so jointly, all four of these together give you the probability of selecting the correct uh, word at the lexical level. Moving on, we also have the probability of retrieving the target phonemes given what you selected at the lexical level. And we have the probability, if you fail to retrieve the correct phonemes, the probability that it will create a, re a real word from the target word by chance. And we have the probability that if you had selected a random word at the lexical level, that a phoneme change will create a random word by chance. There's a little bit of sleight of hand going on here with mapping it onto the network, but it's in terms of the way to think about these probabilities, that's it's a good, it's a good, pretty good match. Okay, so that was the cognitive part. The psychometric part uh, comes from item response theory. Again, Dr. Fragadiadis talked about this uh, in our last talk uh, with respect to just overall accuracy. Um, and the idea here is that the probability of success um, can be expressed as a function of two numbers, uh, two independent numbers. There's the ability of the person and the difficulty of the item. And these two equations are, are essentially the same. So if you, the difference between the ability and the difficulty tells us the log odds of success. And here you can plug the ability and the difficulty into this equation and get this as a probability. And this is an illustration of what that looks like. So on the x-axis, you have the person ability in logits. So these typically range from negative three to three, like a z-score. Zero, um, these numbers don't actually mean anything on their own. Zero doesn't correspond to a population average. 
um, the closest thing it corresponds to is 50%. So if if the difficulty of, of the item is zero and the ability is zero, then the probability of success is 50%. If the difficulty is lower than zero, like negative one, the, and the ability is higher than the difficulty, then there's a high probability of success around 0.9. And if there is a high difficulty item, the item is more difficult than the ability, then you see there's a low probability of success. Okay, so this, this, come, this comes uh, as a standard typical model in item response theory and Roche modeling, um, and it can get more complicated. This is about as simple as it gets. And the idea here is not just to get an overall measure of difficulty, right? We can get different types of difficulty, right? Different types of errors. So we can, and, and these, these items uh, I come directly from fitting the model here. And so you can see this for lexical selection, easy words, right? Four-footed animals, we recognize those very quickly. Things like skulls and thermometers are a little sort of harder to, to recognize and come up with those words. And so, uh, but phonologically, cat and skull are easy to say, and elephant and thermometer are harder to say. So these are different dimensions of difficulty. Okay, so we estimate the model. Uh, we, we get a bunch of data and we estimate the variables in this model. And this is called the directed acyclic graph. And we use this for Bayesian estimation. It sort of tells us all the relationships and assumptions of our model. So what we do, we, we figure out um, the ability. We, we sort of just guess the ability for a subject um, at, on a particular process uh, and the difficulty of the item for a particular process. Those two things combine to give us the probability of success. Those are those branch probabilities. Once we have those branch probabilities, then the MPT model equations here tell us the probability of each response type, right? That, that's these equations tell us the probability of each response type. Once we know the probability of each response type, then we know what to expect. These are the overt responses, the categorical responses. And so then we can work backwards from observing categorical responses to figure out what are the most likely abilities and difficulties that led to those responses. So we looked at a lot of data. So 275 participants from a database uh, of folk, uh, patient data that was collected in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and then um, another 90 people, actually one of them. Uh, so a lot of these analyses are just with 89 people because one of them didn't produce any attempts on picture naming, but that, which is not a problem for the MPT model. It is a problem for the Dell model. So 90, 90 of these people came from um, Columbia, South Carolina. This is the Polar Archive. Um, and um, together, there's 365, 364. The WAB, Western aphasia battery, aphasia quotient is an overall measure of severity. And this is the sort of general distribution. These are all folks who are healthy enough to participate in research. So it's not exactly a random sample. It's a sample of convenience. And these are sort of different types of aphasia that are classified by the Western aphasia battery. Um, so we have a bunch of different types of aphasia in there as well. And the goal here was to be broad and inclusive. This is different than a lot of uh, neuropsychology research where we're looking for very interesting patterns. What we're trying to do here is get as many people as we can, as much data as we can, and try and make the, the truthiest statements we can about uh, everybody, sort of general statements. So we estimated the participant abilities and item difficulties from 63,875 total naming responses. Um, we use Gibbs sampling with four chains and a uh, thousand samples per chain. I'm not going to say much about that, but this is sort of the the magic. Uh, this is uh, it's basically a way to cheat at doing calculus and doing difficult uh, probability calculations. Um, so this is how we estimate those parameters. And on the left here, you can see these are the distributions of responses. So on the top is correct responses, and then the errors. And so, you know, we have a good range of correct responses and the errors tend to cluster at floor because it's not like everybody's making just one type of error. However, when we estimate the probabilities, so first of all, there is no probability of a correct response. Remember, we have to multiply all of those probabilities together to get the probability of a correct response. And when you do that, um, what you can see is that you can completely recover all of the information that is in the accuracy data. The accuracy statistic is recoverable from these parameters. So that's good to know. Um, but furthermore, these have a much nicer distributions. 
right? The pe people are sort of centered and spread out a lot better. Um, and here's the relationship with the ability and the uh, prototypical error type. For attempt, you can see this is, again, a, basically a perfect relationship, which is what we expect because this is the only uh, ability that depends on one error type. The rest of these are strongly related to their prototypical error type, um, but it's clearly not the same information, right? These are not identical. It's encoding something slightly different than the overt statistics. So we also looked at the S weight and P weight for the same data, and we look at how these all relate to each other. And the basic takeaway, again, so the attempt is these, these, uh, these are R squared values. These are just replicated from over here. Um, and what we can see is that, again, attempt is basically the same as just the attempt rate. Uh, it does have some stronger relationships with S weight and P weight. This could be because the attempt category includes semantic descriptions and some other things. It's not a very clean category. Um, but otherwise, the semantic lexem uh, and fawn abilities, so lexem and le uh, sem and lexem are both much more strongly correlated with S weight than their prototypical error type, and of course, much more strongly correlated with S weight than P weight. Fawn is, lex fawn is different than the rest, the rest of these lexical abilities because it's more strongly related to P weight than the other ones. It kind of has this interesting blend um, of a relationship. And FON is very strongly related to P weight, but it's not a perfect relationship. And it's more strongly related than, than the overt non-word error types. So the, the, the takeaway here is that the MPT abilities are capturing some information that's more like the SP model um, than the overt frequency statistics, but it's not the same information. There's still some more stuff going on here. So what is, what's going on here? Um, so cross-validation. We can look at, you know, if we estimate model parameters based on picture naming responses, can we use that, that model to then predict brand, brand new picture naming data? So essentially what we do is we poke holes in our data and we try to recover that, the, the missing data with the model. We sort of set it aside. So we use a holdout procedure. And we only do this once because we have lots of data. It, there's different ways you can do cross-validation. This is actually fairly standard in industry as I understand it, but we only did this once. But we use a holdout procedure where we set aside one set of data, 50 items, and we predict per person, and we predict the training. Uh, so we use that to, to train the model, and then we predict Sorry, the other way. We predict 50 items, we train the model on 125 items. And rather than just sort of picking out, uh, randomly removing, you know, all of, you know, let's say 50 random items and just removing the whole items, we, we sort of have a sliding cipher here. So we pick a few, we pick the 50 random items for participant one, and then we slide over and we knock out the, those items, you know, plus one from participant two, and we do this, and right, so the, the point here is this ensures that the rows and the columns each have enough data to encode information. Like if we didn't have information from the items, then the MPT model wouldn't be able to use that to, to leverage for, for predictions, okay? So we can look at out of sample predictions at the test level. Um, so this is predicting the response frequency summed over the whole data test, and this is what the SP model is designed to when you to map you know map onto and explain when you give the SP model data to fit you give it the frequency counts not the individual responses to individual items so this is sort of playing on its own turf um, and again this is cross validation so it is absolutely not guaranteed that just because we have more parameters in the MPT model that we will get better predictions out of sample in fact it's sort of the other way around um, but uh good news we we find that on the so the root mean square error is sort of the average deviation uh in terms of the number of items that that uh you would expect on each category so you know if you predict 25 items correct with the sp model um you can expect that probably they got 23 or 27 items correct um, and that's for that's averaged over each response type and you can see that the MPT model on average has lower error, that's uh, statistically significant lower error. And the scatter plot here shows the, the errors. So the diagonal line is the identity line, points above this line are better predicted by the MPT model. And then we've got these two 
uh, dotted line, these bands uh, and that are arbitrary, is, is plus or minus two uh, root mean square error deviations. So points above and below that line are really strongly being predicted by one model better than the other. And there's 11 of these folks who are better predicted by MPT and one who's better predicted by SP. So what's going on with these 11 folks who are better predicted by MPT? Why is MPT, you know, where is it, where, you know, how is it getting this better information, better predictions? Well, six of these participants had significantly different training and testing distributions, right? And this is according to a Fisher's exact test. And this is a problem for SP because SP only simulates the CAT network. So as far as it's concerned, any two data sets are just, they're both naming the same item CAT. It can't make different predictions for different data sets. The MPT model can make different predictions based on the estimated item difficulties. So if it's, if it's picking up useful information about item difficulties, it can predict that your accuracy is gonna go down if it thinks your testing items are harder than your training items. Um, another poss possibility for gaining prediction accuracy is that um, the SP model is highly constrained by, by its statistics. It can't predict certain error patterns, whereas the MPT model is more descriptive um, and any sort of pattern is theoretically possible. Um, it's just we, we put confidence levels on them. So the, it's a little bit less strict in its assumptions about which patterns are possible to see. So one of these people produced too many formal errors, two of them produced too many unrelated errors, and five of them produced too many mixed errors. And this is kind of interesting because as you'll see, mixed errors turn out to be pretty interesting and important, um, both theoretically and uh, quantitatively. So at the item level, where now we're guessing the response for each trial, um, for each participant, if you just randomly guess one of the seven response types, we collapse the non-words into one category for the, for the um, network model. There's, we have an expected accuracy of 14.3%. You're just randomly guessing num uh, responses. You have about a 14% chance of getting it right. However, you look at the training data and you realize, hey, most of these responses are correct. I'm just gonna guess correct responses all the time and assume that people with aphasia never make errors. This is not a very good theory uh, of picture naming, but it's, it, it's predictive uh, at 55.8%. You just do that. So if we fit the model with the SP model and we try to predict the most likely response type for each item, remember that the model can has to predict the same response for all of the items. So if correct is the most likely response for this person, it'll predict correct for all items. If non-words are most likely, that's what it'll predict. So it does better than random, but not as good as just guessing the mode. It gets, you know, it's, but again, this is, it's not designed to predict at the item level. It's, it's pretty handicapped at this level. What we're show, but what we can show is that when the NPT model um, predicts things at the item level, it's doing better than just random. It's doing better than just guessing the mode. It, it's getting useful, predictive information at the item level. So it's getting more information about picture naming than the SP model. Again, perhaps this is not surprising. It has more parameters. It has the ability to leverage item information, but this expansion in parameters is theoretically motivated. Um, we're not just randomly adding parameters. So, and we're getting more information. So this is good. This is, this is heartening. But what other data do the MPT model parameters encode information about? Right, so when we take the temperature of somebody's picture naming ability, if you you know forgive the metaphor, sort of what other things do we can we learn from this? And so here's sort of a map of how I've been thinking about how the psychometric model ties different aspects of neuropsychology together. Um, you see this lurking in the middle here. The psychometric model is really the the linchpin here of this sort of conceptual network. Um, and we've been talking about how it relates to picture naming responses and the psychometric model. We've also been talking about how it's been informed by the connectionist model. Um, but there are some other things lurking out here. So lexical item properties are going to affect the difficulties of the items. Uh, presumably the abilities that we estimate are going to relate to neuropsychological assessment scores. And presumably these abilities are also going to relate to location and extent of brain damage. And so if you have some functional anatomy model and pot potentially right, the activation, patterns of brain damage. So if you have some functional anatomy model, 
then that should also inform us about uh, we can learn about your your you know your brain and how the brain relates to these things. <laughs> Excuse me. If we are in fact getting um, getting a good uh, temperature reading, if you will. So, um, and then this all sort of relates down to the you know taken together. This all kind of leads to a uh, increasing our understanding of a neurocomputational speech production model. We take all this stuff together, hopefully. That, that we'll get ideas for how to you know, continue developing um, our understanding of that. Okay, so we can look at neuropsychology test scores. We looked at semantic, lexical semantic comprehension scores from 127 people from the Philadelphia cohort. This, this is all the people who had these tests available. Again, trying to be as inclusive as possible. So synonymy triplets, where you select uh, which two of three words are synonyms. Uh, Peabody picture vocabulary test, where you hear a word and you have to point to which picture matches the word. Camels and cactus test, where again, you see four pictures, but the, the probe is another picture and you have to match which ones are semantically related. We also looked at speech production um, test scores from uh, the same folks. Uh, so Philadelphia repetition test is you, uh, you repeat a, a heard word, um, same words from the naming test, uh, or a non-word. Um, that's a, a, a non-word repetition test, uh, an immediate serial recall where you repeat a list of words and the list gets longer and longer until you can't do it anymore. So this is a um, short-term memory uh, test, but it also involves speech production. Um, we also looked at, in the other cohort, which we wanted to get the same kinds of tests. They didn't give the exact same test, but, but the idea here is that because we have a theory of how these things should relate, we can look for whatever tests map onto these you know, constructs that we're trying to get at. So lexical semantic comprehension, we looked at pyramids and palm trees, um, which is like camels and cactus, but there's only two choices instead of four. And for speech production, uh, we looked at the diadochokinetic rate, which is a measure of apraxia. The folks in this group um, from South Carolina, about 40% of them had concomitant apraxia of speech, which is a motor um, disorder. And uh, we looked at WAB repetition, where you repeat words, phrases, or sentences. We also looked at lexical property measures. Um, so log lexical frequency, phoneme length, the phonological neighborhood density, which is the number of words that sound like a target word, as well as age of acquisition. Um, the first three don't include, don't take into account word sense, but age of acquisition does. Uh, and we got these from um, an objective measure of test-based uh, measure where um, this comes from school children and you ask, you know, are, do they know these words? On the PNT, it's worth noting, there's very little variance on this measure on purpose. These are supposed to be items that um, people with a stroke are gonna likely be able to recognize and know. So 150 of these are learned by age two, 23 are learned by age four, one item Van is learned by age six, and one item Steph is learned by age 10. So this is, uh, but but somebody actually emailed me and said, hey, you should be looking at, at this. It's an important variable. We find that it is related to lots of other speech production things. So you should look at it. So I did. Um, and then finally, we can look at structural neuroimaging. So this, again, this comes from the South Carolina cohort. These are, this is an 81 uh, subjects uh, subset. And we got binary lesion masks that were drawn by a neurologist and worked to a standard template. And so these are just a few examples of where you might find these lesions. And this is the overlap um, in, in the group. And then we encode this information using an atlas of uh, intrinsic connectivity uh, that has 384 regions total, 139 left hemisphere regions were damaged in at least 10 patients, uh, greater than 10 patients. And so in each of these regions, we have some amount of uh, lesion volume. And we also look at uh, white matter tracts as well. And then we're gonna do regression analyses to look at the relationships between MPT parameters, model parameters, and these other measures. So for neuropsychology test scores, we're gonna look at stepwise regression to identify unique contributions of the abilities to test scores, lexical properties. We're gonna look at unique contributions of lexical properties to item difficulties that are estimated from the MPT or the network. And structural neuroimaging, uh, we're going to look at combinatoric multiple linear regression to identify regions where damage predicts a deficit. And the idea here um, is it's a little bit fancier than regular regression, but not too much. Um, the statistics are a little bit updated, but the model is essentially a linear model. So 
permutation and bootstrap analysis is used to identify candidate regions that have a strong and robust association between lesion volume in that region and the uh, ability or disability, as it were. And then we use cross-validation of all candidate combinations to identify an optimal set of predictor regions. And so we try to predict the ability using voxels that are inside a critical set of regions and voxels that are outside of a critical set of regions. And the beta weight, the cost for the critical voxels is going to be very strong and the cost is going to be very low or close to zero, non-significant for lesions outside. Okay, and I'm going to present this, I'm going to go sort of uh, parameter by parameter and kind of ask, okay, so which of, you know, we've got six thermometers for naming now. What, if, what are each of them sort of measuring and taking the temperature of? Uh, so, and I'm going to briefly look at attempt and SEM. So, uh, because attempt is sort of this default heterogeneous category, I don't want to make too many strong claims about it. It is, we sort of think about it as being pre-lexical issues, although there's a fair amount of research out there showing, you know, these can result from during lexical processing or post-lexical editing. Um, and it is, I think, perhaps worth noting that the attempt ability contributed to lots of tasks, um, synonymy triplets, camels and cactus, pyramids and palm trees, and these multi-word repetition tasks. So um, anywhere where semantics is kind of coming into play, the attempt ability is also contributing. Um, and it was influenced by lexical frequency, phonological density, and age of acquisition. Um, so both a sort of frequency lexical measure, a phonological measure, and this sort of um, age of acquisition measure. And the critical regions here account for 45% of the variance in observed uh, attempts. The unrelated errors, so SEM relates to unrelated errors. These are mostly perseveration errors. Um, and um, SEM contributed to the vocabulary test, the word repetition, and multi-word repetition. Um, it was not influenced by item properties. And, it just had this one frontal region that was associated with, with these uh, responses, counting for 25%. Okay, so Lexem, moving on, uh, semantic errors. So these are pretty popular in the literature. Um, these are something that are thought to index uh, semantic comprehension and processing, generally executive function. Um, and we found that it contributed to synonymy triplets. It accounts for about 48% of the scores in synonymy triplets. And it was influenced by lexical frequency and age of acquisition independently. So this is another interesting thing that is talked about in the literature, are independent effects of frequency and age of acquisition. Um, and you can see the critical regions here sort of highlight uh, what is typically thought of as a semantic processing network, um, sort of the dorsal, you know, frontal and, and posterior parietal stuff. Um, and then also the anterior temporal lobe, which is kind of a semantic hub area sometimes. For lexphon, these are formal errors. These are words that sound like the target um, and are real words, but not semantically related. So this contributed to the multi-word repetition scores. When you, when you have to process multiple word forms, the word form ability is the most relevant. That's great. Also, it, might be hinting at the possibility of detecting multi-word repetition deficits, which is a specific type of deficit that has been um, detected and uh, described in the literature as resulting from multiple word forms competing and, uh, and, and leading to problems when you have to produce multiple words. And so we're detecting that in a single word production task. Um, it was only influenced by lexical frequency. That was the only thing we could find that influenced it, and it was strongly influenced by lexical frequency. Um, as a side note, we also looked at whether uh, this ability could predict the grammatical category of the formal errors, because the idea here is that if errors are coming from the lexical level, they should also be nouns, whereas if they come from sublexical level, if you're randomly flipping phonemes and happen to create a word, you're not going to be respecting grammatical category boundaries. So we looked at 2,902 formal errors. There were 83 participants who made at least one non-noun. Um, the Correlation was at about 0.41 for lexphon and the non-noun rate, meaning that there's a protective effect of, uh, you know, as you have a lexical uh, disability, you are less likely to produce non-nouns, which is what we expect from the theory. And also we looked at item level risk of a non-noun. And again, the higher your ability, the lower the risk of a non-noun at the lexical formal level. 
and this ability was stronger than effects that that we found for the SP weights, where this was this report this effect was um, initially modeled. At least that's where I initially found out about it. And this network explains about 29% of the variance. Lexical selection. So these are mixed errors. Again, this is an interesting one. Mixed errors have played a role in theory because they they show that the lexical and phonological levels are interacting during because we find uh, mixed errors more than you would expect just due to random phonological uh, errors. Um, and in fact, the, the 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 tree model assumes that mixed errors come from the lexical level. Um, I've done some simulations that show that this is a, in fact, a reasonable assumption. There are only a few items where you will ever get a mixed error just from randomly flipping phonemes, um, and even then, it's pretty rare. At, at most, at the at most, you're going to get a 10% chance of seeing a mixed error from, pho from from phonology. So it is reasonable to assume that it comes from the lexical level. Um, this ability is strongly, the most strongly related um, ability for comprehension tasks. So the mixed errors give you the most information about comprehension tasks. That's kind of interesting because semantic errors are typically what are talked about as being the proxy for semantic uh, processing. It was influenced by lexical frequency and phonological length, so both a lexical and a phonological level thing. So this is sort of getting at comp um, interaction. And longer targets were replaced by shorter competitors. As a bonus, if you look at functional activation and you look at the residuals in functional activation, so these are 64 patients. This is their bold contrast of picture naming. Uh, this is just sort of the av. There's no test here. This is just sort of the average bold network for aphasic people. Uh, people with aphasia doing picture naming. And if you ask, are there any regions where activation um, explains why you might be better or worse at picture naming than you would expect given your lesion, right? There's, is there any sort of compensation uh, in the activation? We find that yes, in the right fusiform gyrus, there is a relationship between activation and ability above and beyond um, your uh, let's see, I'm going to have to rush through the rest of this. I'm going to try to squeeze in as much as I can here. So again, for fawn, this is the last ability. Um, it's related to non-words, sometimes real words if, if the lexical item allows. It contributed to all of the speech production tasks and strongly, much more strongly than the p-weight. Um, it was the only ability that was influenced, uh, sorry, it was influenced by all of the lexical properties. And it was the only ability that was significantly affected when apraxia of speech was excluded. So over here, these pink network regions are associated with phonology, uh, the phon ability in aphasia. Um, the this sort of teal uh, blue region is only associated when participants with apraxia of speech, a motor disorder, are included. Um, so just to summarize, here are we found that all the MP, all of these tests uh, are more strongly associated with MPT abilities than right the MPT parameters than the SP parameters. So the mimicking MPT is mimicking these statistics better. Um, they are also more sensitive to the lexical properties, including um, age of acquisition. S weights didn't pick that up at all. This is if you estimate S weight and P weight by collapsing over the uh, people rather than collapsing over the items. And then this is sort of a summary of all the brain regions, right? These are distinguishable networks, distinguishable brain regions. And just to touch base again with the literature, if you look uh, at S weights and P weights using voxel-wise lesion symptom mapping, you this is what you get for S weight, um, and this is what you get for P weight, kind of different, um, but also you kind of get these two big blobs of networks. We are separating these things out a lot more, as you can see. Um, also, this, these results aren't totally replicable exactly. Uh, so another group basically did the same thing. And so red uh, here is P weight. This is this one. And blue here is S weight, which would be all this. So it's it's a little bit different results. So kind of, but you know, we're kind of seeing a general pattern of temporal versus motor stuff. And finally, if you do uh, semantic errors versus non-word errors, and you actually try to predict these things with um, SVR, LSM, these are the maps that you're getting. Again, this would be sort of S-weight, semantic, lexical stuff, and P-weight, motor stuff. 
and they're getting accuracies of about 10% and 11%. So as you can see, our we're, we're the temperature that we're taking is uh, of picture naming, as it were, is, is showing much stronger relationships with brains. I'm going to really quickly talk about treatment. So um, we have been collecting treatment data over, over 12 weeks where they get two PNTs uh, every time they come in and they get uh, a, uh, either a semantic or a phonological treatment in between and then we have some follow-up stuff. And so we can track these abilities over time using Bayesian the same sort of Bayesian modeling. So this is the original MPT model where we try to estimate the, the um, we, we know what the difficulties are already. So we just try to estimate their abilities and how they change over time. And this is, these variables describe how abilities change over time. So you have some starting ability, you have some intrinsic variance, some day-to-day -day variability. If you have two PNTs on the same day, the ability is gonna change. And then you have real change due to the therapy in between the intervals. So this handles missing data, it separates intrinsic variance from real change, and it gives 95% credible intervals for the, for the change um, that allows us to do statistical tests to say, you know, how confident are we and make inferences that, there, that this is statistically significant real change. Here are some examples of, here's um, the fawn ability changing due to semantic treatment, attempt ability changing due to semantic treatment, uh, here's the uh, SEM ability changing due to semantic treatment, and here's the FON ability changing due to phonological treatment. And so, so we can get, you know, six of these tracks for each person. Um, we can ask using an overall measure who responded, who didn't. Um, this is the probability of correct. And if you do a median split or 0.05, you say I want 5% increase before I say the therapy worked. Um, you get the same answer, 22, it's half the people responded to these therapies and half didn't. Then you can ask, did these people who responded, did they have a specific response somewhere in, in their naming pattern? Um, 16 of them did have a specific response. And then you can ask, did that specific response relate to the therapy that they got? And it looks like, yes, there is a significant difference. People who had semantic, who people who had specific improvements in their, uh, due to semantic therapy, tended to have these improvements in these early abilities, attempt and SEM, whereas people who had significant specific improvements due to phonological therapy tended to have the improvement on these more comp lexical competitive processes. Okay, finally, to summarize, we published this thing. Some of this information is still in preparation. There's just a lot to cover, as you can see. Um, we have a website. You can use this model. Go here, download the data. You can download the MATLAB code. There's also an online calculator that you can use. I recommend using the MATLAB code. The online calculator does not get the same answers. It's sort of a toy example. Main point, cognitive psychometric model is a measurement tool that extracts useful quantitative information from picture naming responses. More information is encoded about other behavioral test scores by the MPT abilities than by network properties or frequency statistics. MPT difficulties are more sensitive than network properties to objective lexical properties. MPT abilities relate to distinguishable brain injuries and functions, and MPT abilities can distinguish real change due to therapy from day-to-day -day variance and can detect specific effects of different therapy types. So I know that was a lot to cover, um, and there's probably some questions out there. I just wanted to acknowledge um, the funding that we that we have been lucky enough to receive um, and all the great work that the C-STAR group is, is doing, um, including this lecture series. Um, also the stroke survivors and caregivers and research participants make this possible, as well as all of the students and speech language pathologists um, over in South Carolina hopefully are watching. Um, you, you are uh, work is very much appreciated and critical for this. Um, of course, the UC Irvine Language Sciences Department, and a special thank you to Bill Batchelder, who passed away last year, but um, was instrumental in introducing me to this, and also, I think, introducing the world to this kind of field of um, cognitive psychometrics. So thank you, Bill. Um, and thank you to you. Awesome, Grant. Um, I, I got to tell you, uh, you got a standing ovation here when you said that uh, statisticians shouldn't tell scientists what to think. So you were, you know, just cruising uh, from then on. Why don't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. Questions, uh, questions from your end first, and if you don't mind repeating the question so that the online audience can hear it, and then we'll turn to questions from our okay. side. Okay. 
Okay, no problem. So questions from UC Irvine audience. Questions? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the question was, you know, we did these, we, you know, we did this search for, for critical networks and we found that, that, you know, different um, temperature gauges sort of tapped into these different networks. Um, these different abilities tapped into these different networks. And so could it have been the case that we pulled out the same networks? And I, I think absolutely it could be. In fact, so there is some overlap in the region. So so there's nothing preventing, you know, two regions from being implicated by the same, uh, sorry, uh, the same region being implicated by two different abilities. And that does in, it happen. Um, but, it, it, you know, especially if you, look at sort of the correlations, you know, how similar the correlations are with S weight, you know, so uh, SEM and LexSEM, uh, you know, they all have sort of very similar correlations with S weight, pretty strong correlation, you know, 70, 75% of the uh, variance is, is shared. So you might expect that, you know, these uh, people's, I think, I, I find that people overinterpret correlations um, and how much information, right, a small difference in correlation can, when you start to look at other data, can really start to, to you know, those differences really can, can start to shine and be meaningful. So I think that's exactly what happened, is that, you know, the, the it kind of looks like they're encoding similar information behaviorally, um, but they don't have to, in the, and, and you might expect that they would in also encode similar uh, brain networks, but they don't. So it kind of supports the idea that the parameters of That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And so, so the question, you know, is, is, you know, does that provide validation that these things are, are really tapping into different things? And, and that's exactly what I would say. And, and that's how I was uh, thinking about it and approaching it is saying, you know, if these things really are measuring different things, um, right. And, and the, right. The S weight basically says, no, they're, they're all the same thing, right? It's all just connection, one sort of form of connections, and it's really just the statistics of the item that you're naming that's gonna push this around. Um, so, yeah, the, I think that the, the going into it, if you're, if you're thinking, you know, the SP model is your model, um, yeah, there's no reason to expect that, that we would see different lesions for lexical abilities. Uh, yeah, it's a good question, yes. Uh, so the question is, can I briefly describe the therapies for uh, phonology and semantics? And the answer is sort of. Um, I am familiar with it only sort of through hearsay of what my colleagues have told me. So the semantic therapy is a, a and so folks over in South Carolina, you can jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, but the semantic therapy is you add, you, you're asking people to name pictures, but bef before you do it or while you do it, you sort of prompt them to come up with semantic features. And there's certain um, types of features that are that you're supposed to come up with, like like a personal story about a time you saw this thing, or um, you know where do you typically find this thing, or you know what's the color of this, th things like that. So um, and and the idea is that generating these features uh, while you're trying to name the target, it links up the semantic features in the word so that the activation sort of cascades better and, and allows you to, to come up with the word better. The phonological stuff I'm less uh, familiar with, I, I think it's a cueing paradigm where you kind of give them some of the sounds as they as they try to name it. Um, and, and so they, uh, is, is that right? Anyone want to chip in? Can you hear us? Yeah. No, you're completely striking out, Grant. Um, <laughs> completely striking out. <laughs> so the way that we do this is that for the semantic approach, we actually came up with three different therapies that have been described in the literature, and they use different things. It would take a long time to explain everything, the details. But 
one of the things that you were alluding to is what is called semantic feature analysis, where you focus specifically on the semantic features of a given lexical item. But we also have two other tasks. So generally in a single session, which is 45 minutes, we split it into 15 minutes for each one of the three tasks. And they get at semantics in different ways. It's the same thing for the phonology. So uh, there are three phonological approaches, but it's not a single approach because we were we were worried that we would get then maybe a, a more sort of a, a narrow kind of an improvement. So, right, so just summarize, basically there are several different types of therapies for each that have all been described in the literature. Um, it's a couple that try to target semantics and a couple that try to target phonology. Um, yeah, and, and so a, a lot of my, as you can, so I'm, I'm ignorant about some of, some of these things, um, and some of the imaging uh, parameters and the therapy parameters, and in some ways, it's, uh, I take that as a sort of methodological benefit. It's a little bit of blinding um, so that I'm, you know, I, I mean, I know that they're doing therapies. I know what the therapies are and sort of what they're trying to do. But if I don't know the details, then I can't sort of manipulate my model to try to fit some sort of very specific paradigm. And because what I'm hoping is that other researchers will take these numbers and try to apply them to their analyses. And I don't know what they'll be doing. Um, so I, I'm hoping that these will be sort of robust. Grant, if you don't mind, we have uh, one uh, person here who needs to uh, uh, leave and is really eager okay. to ask one question. So okay. Okay. We'll come back. I think okay. You know. All right. Hey, Grant, this is Julie. So here's my eager question. Um, and I apologize, I have to leave uh, for another meeting. So with regards to the neologisms, um, I noticed that when you drop out people with apraxial speech, your R squared goes up for the lesion analysis. Yes. So I wanted to hear what your thoughts are about how, is there any hope of ever adjudicating between neologisms that sort of would arise from the motor system as a for the rest of the mechanisms? Is there any way that we could ever figure out what is coming from where with regards to those kinds of errors? Absolutely, yes. And, and that is um, part of our proposal for the renewal for you know the next five years of CSTAR is to look exactly at that. And, and because I am encouraged by this finding that, um, and, th and this was something that, that you guys found, Alex uh, Basilakos, um, and, and company over there found a sort of similar finding that if you look at speech errors, um, these non-word errors, and you sort of separate them out by uh, motor speech characteristics, they tend to, the, the networks, the brain networks that are responsible separate out in much the same way that, that we found. Um, and, and like you said, I think the, exactly the reason that you get an increase in, in that predictive ability of the, of the lesion networks is because Exactly like you said, it's sort of the heterogeneous causes that are um, so. Uh, if you if you separate out the causes better, then you get a a, a better model, right? That 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 um, generalizes better because you're you're talking about a more homogeneous type of deficit. So yes, the answer to that is emphatically yes. I hope that we can uh, separate out neologisms uh, from that arise, you know, in the temporal lobe versus the motor uh, system. So, um, you had another question? Mm -hmm. well, oh, no, okay. <laughs> yes, uh, okay. Yes, absolutely. And this is another, that was actually, that's another, uh, that's the other part of our proposal for the next five years is to look exact as, at that as, uh, the, so the question is whether there was a relationship between the parameters that we estimate and how effective therapy is. And we don't know yet. What I, what I showed was that therapies tend to have different effects when they work. What we don't know is whether we can predict if a therapy will work based on the parameters. Hopefully we can. Um, and that's something that we're going to look into. Um, so, any questions from the room here? How about over there or online? So, 
So we have um, um, a couple of questions also from online. So why don't we do those? I don't know if you can see them on your screen. If not, I can read them out to you. No problem. Let's see. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. OK. Um, from Garasimos. All right. Hey, how's it going? Uh, impressive work. How can one assess the assumptions of the IRT side of the model, such as local independence, equal discrimination, et cetera? That is an excellent question, and it's not one that I have focused on too much um, because, um, I mean, my, my only sort of justification for that is the sort of mimetic modeling approach where I'm kind of saying, you know, I'm not, I'm not so concerned about, um, you know, formal, uh, formal mathematical statistical analyses of things. I just kind of want something that works. And so to the extent that, that, that this works, um, you know, I'm happy and I am, uh, certainly, I think that those issues that you brought up are, are important issues. I think that there are ways to address those in a sort of Bayesian way um, in terms of, you know, holding things out and, and you know, um, you know, split half reliability and, and, and these kinds of things. Um, but I, I know what you're talking, you're, you're, you're talking about sort of more uh, psychometric, uh, formal, formal, um, concepts in, in psychometric uh, testing and things that, that are important. Um, I'm not 100% sure about the exact, uh, so hopefully that, that kind of got at what you were, what you were asking. Um, sort of broadly, I, I don't know exactly, but I think that those are important, important things. Um, thanks, for, okay, so Alex Widerski, thanks for the nice talk. Oh, good, awesome. Um, so Garasimo says it does. I answered his question. Okay, so thanks for the nice talk. Can you talk about methods you utilize to confirm initial model fit of the MPT model? This can be challenging with models with so many parameters, such as the MPT model. For example, how did you affirm convergence of the MCMC -MC chains, and did you perform a posterior predictive check? These are great questions. So, um, Yes, for the chains, what I did was, um, this is recommended in um, Michael Lee uh, and, uh, oh, I'm blanking on his co-author, but there's a textbook where they recommend, you know, you plot the chains and you just look for convergence. So that's what I did. Um, I actually went through every single, uh, all of the 3,000 parameters quickly and, and sort of eyeballed them for convergence. Um, and they and they do converge very quickly, um, like after you know just a few samples. I didn't really even use burnout. Um, so for uh, posterior predictive check, um, so in the paper what we did, so I, I I did do a posterior predictive check, and and what I did was I compared uh, posterior predictive um, predictions with uh, machine learning. So you can see this, uh, and I mentioned this in my last talk, uh, and you can see this in the paper, in the 2018 paper, where we, we I just asked, okay, well, if I, if I use machine learning, a theoretical algorithms that have similar numbers of parameters, um, you know, how good do those fit the data in sample fit? So, so posterior prediction. Um, and, uh, and it does really good. It does, it, it does a good job of, um, of making predictions in uh, in a way that ma maximizes accuracy as well as um, the types of errors that you're able to capture. Um, so yes, it, uh, so yeah, it can be challenging um, with with lots of of parameters. So another thing that um, you can look at is sort of DIC and things like that. Um, I wasn't as interested in that. My my main goal to sort of ask uh, and test whether my model fit well is to ask if I could find anything else that fits better. So far the answer is no. Um, unless you unless you already know what the data is. There, there are no predictive models um, that I have found that make better uh, predictions or fits within within the sample. Any questions from here? Um, 
Uh, but yeah, and also that code is all online. I, as I mentioned on the website, you can now download all the data and that code um, to play around with. Grant, it doesn't seem we have yeah. questions from our end of the room, uh, other than the ones that Great. were asked. Um, I don't know if you have questions on your end, but none online. Nope. Well, in that case, thank nope. you very much. And thanks to our Great, online audience. You. And see you next time, December 18th, for Linda Warrell. Thank you, Grant. All right, thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Hi, everyone.